Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I'd like to thank all the IBS staff and also Excel to invite me. So today, I'd like to talk about the deep learning for detecting the anthropogenic signal, global warming signals using the uh, daily precipitation data. So first, before uh, while I'm preparing this presentation materials, I think it would be uh, that the audiences will be some kind of uh, from the wide uh, wide variety of subjects. So, but in this room, I think most of the audience is quite expert on this field, so I'm not sure some of the slides will be um, quite easy to some of you. But yeah, just keep in mind that it is uh, first, firstly designed to the audiences which is from the wide subjects. So uh, the, as you might know, the uh, impact of the global warming is quite uh, ubiquitous and uh, expected to occur in various time scales. So first thing we could expect is that the long-term changes that the global warming uh, increased. Uh, so once we have the climate change, that uh, there would be the increase in the surface temp near surface temperature in time, and also the we expecting the s continuous sea level rises in the left. So all uh, at at the uh, longest time spectrum, and on the other hand, we also s expecting some changes at the shortest time spectrum, uh, shortest time s spectrums too. So. We are expecting the uh, more, much more frequent occurrence of the extreme precipitation and the wildfires and the typhoons, etc. So, it's very hard to understand uh, the the impact of the global warming in which will be occurred in the various time scale and its utmost importance to understand this complex uh, impact of the global warming to make the optimal policy making to uh, minimize any hazards uh, might be happen due to the global warming. So one of the things uh, we normally ac ac access to examine the global, the impact of the global warming is using the cl global climate models. We often call it as a GCMs. So by increasing the number of the greenhouse gases by just putting different numbers in our computer programming, then we can access, uh, access that the changes, uh, how the temperature and precipitation and all the, uh, of the variables will change due to the global warming within this uh, complex, clo uh, complex computer programming. So this is the uh, long term. So in, in this case, it's the 20 year average difference of the temperature and precipitation using the uh, GCM simulation with high, relatively higher and relatively lower greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So you can, you can expect the increase in the temperature as which is well known to the public. Also, uh, we can also see the changes in the precipitation too. So it is also well known to the climate uh, uh, community, but so once I try to recall that, so the precipitation, the mean precipitation, which in this case, 20 year average, uh, is expected to the increase over the tropics and expected to the decrease over the subtropics and also try to uh, expect it to the increase over, over the middle latitude. So, so we can call this uh, kind of phenomena as the wet gets wetter and dry gets drier mechanisms. And this is well known feature for most of the GCM are simulating. But in th this kind of analysis is the, uh, uh, assess the uh, changes of the global, uh, impact of the global warming in the long-term changes. So as, and as I mentioned before, the impact of the global warming is expected to be occurred in various time scales. So I would say this kind of analysis is only assessing the only one aspect of the global warming. And the most, more importantly, there is a, a raising questions that whether uh, the occurrence of the extreme events, because we are expecting uh, more frequent and extreme events in the global warming. So. Uh, one can ask the questions whether is the extreme events in last few years is due to the global warming. So some can say yes and some can say no because uh, uh, there are a mixture between the impact of the anthropogenic forcing and also there is an impact of the global warming, uh, impact of the natural variability. So once we would say yes, then the anthropogenic forcing can increase the temperature and it 
uh, basically it increases the evaporation and the, in terms of the precipitation, so the precipitation intensity will be increased. And the other, in other aspect, we would say no. Once the natural variability, we call there are many natural variable variations. Uh, for example, ENSO, AO, and monsoon. So there are large, uh, large types of uh, many types of the natural variations. And the case we are experiencing uh, experienced few days, few for few years, is due to the natural variability. So there's a debating issues whether those events are due to the global warming or not. So to separate those two, so we have to examine whether the variation uh, uh, we experience for, for the last uh, few years is due to the uh, anthropogenic forcing or not. So, uh, the, so how can, then how can we do that? So, so all the efforts to separate the impact of the anthropogenic forcing from the impact of the natural variability is called as the uh, climate change detection. So the current climate change de detection method is mostly based on the optimal regression method, which is basically based on the linear regression. So once we define the fingerprint pattern X from the long-term integration of the GCM simulations, then the projected amplitude of the observed field uh, to the, uh, this fingerprint pattern is defined by beta. And the beta quantifies the uh, degree of the uh, impact of the global warming to the observed field. Once we define the betas uh, using the daily data or monthly data, which we are interested in, so we can, we can measure the beta for every day or every month. So once the beta is estimated, we, you, you, we define the variation or the range of the natural variations of the beta. So it, the, the normally, we uh, define the historical period or the uh, pre-industrial simulations using the GCMs. We calculate the range, how, how the beta is bearing with, within the historical period or the pre-industrial period. And once the beta is above the upper limit of the, the range of the beta from the nature or historical period, so we would say that there is a clear impact of the global warming. So in this case, so the, the, the variation of the beta uh, is uh, defined using the historical period, is, which is defined from 1980 to uh, 1850 to 1950 from the historical simulation of the GCM and there is a variation of the beta here. And we can see the beta, which is denoted by the orange dots, is above the, natural the upper limit of the natural variability. So that we can say that, that there is a global warm uh, impact of the global warming, uh, at least at this variable. So this is a surface, uh, surface temperature or something. So we can say that there is a clear impact of the global warming after 2000. And this kind of uh, uh, optimal linear regression method is beneficial to detect the uh, impact of the global warming for the variables whose impact due to the global warming is stationary in time and some fix so that the some fixed pattern is not changed the sensitivity in time. However, for the variables which the impact of the global warming is very variant in time. This kind of optimal regression method is problematic. So to demonstrate the limitation of the linear detection method, we perform the linear detection algorithm. We apply, try to apply to the linear detection algorithm to the uh, large uh, long-term simulation of the CSM2. Uh, this is the one of the GCMs. And uh, the, in the left panel, the, the black line is the true, uh, true AGMT. This is the short term of the annual global mean temperature. So this is the proxy of the global warming in our case. And this is the long-term simulation. So in this case, in this test, we only use the uh, long-term simulation of the GCMs for the simplicity. So the black line is the true, which is the simulation itself uh, of the AGMT. And the other color denotes that the estimation of the AGMT based on the uh, uh, 
two meter, for example, two meter temperature, two meter specific humidity, and precipitation field. Uh, so in this case, we uh, try to apply this method to the daily outputs so that there are many dots that which denotes that the estimation of the AGMT using the daily outputs. So for so there's too many uh, dots, but once you uh, once you can count that that so there is a three three hundred sixty five dots for each year. And uh, the annually average value of this daily estimation is denoted by the lines with the different colors. So when you see the uh, lines first, you can see that increase in the AGMT is well estimated for most of the variables while even though there are some large variation is observed for the precipitation. However, the problem is that the range of the natural variability is quite different from variable to variable. For example, the, once we define the, uh, uh, the, the historical period from 1850 to 1950, the variation of the beta here for the two-meter temperature is very small, which is denoted by green dots here. For, however, for the precipitation, the range of the beta during the historical period is relatively huge than other variables. That means the fingerprint parent X for the precipitation, the fingerprint X contains not only the uh, glo uh, global imprints of the uh, global imprints of the uh, global warming, but also contains the day-to-day -day variation, variation signals. That means the fingerprint X. Uh, estimated by linear detection method is not optimal, in, at least for the precipita precipitation. So that there is a large variation of the precipitation, so we can say that the natural variability is, is too large, so it is very hard to above the upper limit of the natural variability, so that the detection is not successful, so when you see the right panels, so, so the number is above one, then we can say there the detection was successful. So. However, for only for the precipitation, the detection is so much delayed because the fingerprint pattern contains not only the global warming signals, but also the signal raised by or induced by the natural variability. So, so from this slide, we can say, we can say that the detection of the global warming anthropogenic forcings, impact of the global anthropogenic forcings is are relatively harder for the precipitation rather than other near surface variables. And the other thing is that the fingerprint pattern based on the linear detection method might not be optimal for at least the precipitation. So that's why the deep learning comes from. So uh, particularly we use the convolutional neural network which is widely used for the computer vision. So as you might know, the CNN is widely used for uh, formulating the autonomous car and the image style transfer or the face recognition. So this kind of technique is widely used for the image recognition, which is the input is the at least two dimensional inputs. So we used this CNN uh, to uh, recognize the global warming patterns embedded in the daily precipitation field. So this is the detection result using the deep learning. So the input of the mo this model is the satellite or real analysis global daily precipitation. And the output is the observed annual global mean temperature. So once we put, uh, put the uh, pre daily pre global daily precipitation field, the model outputs the, the est uh, estimation of the observed annual global mean temperature. So once you take a look at the results, the black line is the uh, observed annual global mean temperature, and red and blue line denotes the annually average of daily estimation of the AGMT by putting daily precipitation data. So we use two independent data set. Uh, one, of, one of them is the satellite one, and the other is the real analysis one to, uh, because there is some to consider the uncertainty in the observations, uh, so the, the uh, precipitation data. So once you take a look at that, so, we, so the first uh, true or the observed AGMT is clearly increasing in time. And also we can see that red line, which is the result from the reanalysis data, 
the estimation of the AGMT is also increased in time, and the same happens for the satellite data, which is observed only after 2000s. That means that the observed AGMT uh, is uh, the increasing of the uh, observed AGMT is somewhat detected uh, in the pr from the by putting the daily precipitation fields, so that we can say that the global warming signal in the precipitation data is somewhat uh, uh, well captured in the deep learning models. And more importantly, to make a detection, we define the natural availability of the uh, natural availability of the uh, a, uh, estimation of the AGMT as the 95% two-tailed 95% confidence level based on the historical uh, range of the beta during the historical period, which is from 1980 to uh, 1850 to 1950, and we so when you and so when you zoom in the result, we can we can see that the annual mean value of the AGMT for both uh, precipitation product is above the upper limit of the natural availability. So we would say the detection of the global warming signal after 2015 is kind of successful using the deep learning models. And the other point, we can uh, define the emerged days as the daily value of the AGMT is above the upper limit of the natural availability. And we can count the number of emerged days for each year. And the result is shows the quite increasing, consistent increasing of the emerged days in time. So for the for both reanalysis and uh, satellite data, so we obtain more than half of the year, so uh, about the 50, more than 50% of the days within a year is affected by the global warming in 2020. That means more than half of days, uh, with, uh, uh, more than half of days in 2020 is somewhat influenced by the global warming. So, and also that the trend of the, this increase is quite robust. So that we once we calculate the linear trend of the emerged days from 1980 to 2000, 2000, 2020, we can see the uh, the trend is quite robustly positive, and this is about cert, uh, it's quite certain that the this value is uh, significantly, significantly different from zero. And to pin down which is responsible for the increase of the uh, estimation of the AGMT in time and how the model, the deep learning model can detect the global warming signals in, embedded in the daily precipitation. We separate the time scales first. So the left panel is the uh, left panel by, by separating, uh, uh, so this is the linear trend of the AGMT by separating the, the time scales. And the total is the numbers what we shown before in the previous slide. And the other bars denotes the linear trend of AGMT by separating, separating after separating the time scales in the input variables. So we can see strong positive values once we perform the 10-day uh, high, high pass filtering. That means uh, over the whole uh, original time series of the precipitation normally. So the 10-day high frequency, uh, high pass filtering data is mostly responsible for the increase of the estimation of the AGMT in, in the deep learning. So the ratio of the emerged days shows the different, uh, quite similar results that the 10 day high pass filter data, that means the period, the, the uh, variation whose period is higher than 10 days uh, is the responsible for the large increase of the emerged days in recent periods. So next, we'd like to pin down which region is responsible for the increase of the AGMT. So the, uh, in this case, we apply the occlusion sensitivity, which is quite well-known and easy uh, denial experiments by replacing any part of the images, uh, the values in the any part of the images as zeros, rather than the original values then we can see the difference in the outputs. Then we can see that uh, particular, uh, the values in the particular area uh, is how robustly contributes to the output values. 
And once we calculate the occlusion sensitivity for every grid cell and every day, then we uh, calculate the linear trend of the occlusion sensitivity. And once it shows the high positive values, that means the this kind of occlusion, so the, the particular region, the occlusion sensitivity is increasing in time. That means it highly cont uh, contributes to the increase of the total estimated AGMT in the final result. So we can pin down the several regions and define those regions as the hotspot regions. So we can say the tropical uh, Eastern Pacific and also Northern South America and the middle latitude storm tracks over both hemisphere can uh, is the hotspot regions to uh, and those the various uh, variations of those regions is responsible for the increase in the AGMT and your global mean temperature in the, at least in this model and this is the uh, to uh, examine the detailed response how the outputs which is the AGMT is respond to the given precipitation anomaly we calculate the uh, uh, relationship, we demonstrate the relationship between the precipitation anomaly, which is expressed as a per percentile here, and the re uh, response of the uh, AGMT, which is the occlusion sensitivity over those hotspot regions. So the result uh, from the tropics is denoted as a left uh, panel, and the result from the uh, middle latitude region is denoted in the right panels. So in the deep learning models, which is denoted by the green line, we can see the V-shaped response that the given uh, precipitation, uh, precipitation input, the AGMT tends to be increased when the precipitation input uh, it goes to higher positive or uh, strongly positive or strongly negative values. That means the uh, the change the sign of change is not uh, meaningful to obtain the higher G AGMT. Rather, that we have either positive, strongly positive, or strongly negative values uh, uh, very important to obtain the high AGMT. That means the mean change to either sign, either positive or negative sign, is not important to estimation the high estimation of the AGMT. But the large variation, so uh, uh, either to either positive or negative value is important uh, to the high AGMT. So it, that, it, uh, that means that strong variability. So for once, we assume that the variation during the peri uh, historical period is like this, and the variation over the recent periods is like this. So that the stronger variation, so higher variability, of the precipitation anomaly to either positive or either negative value is important. Crucial climate change uh, imprints embedded in the daily precipitation. The same happens for the middle latitude storm tracks. We can see the pre-shaped response. And once we take a look at the response function in the linear, uh, linear regression, linear, uh, optimal linear regression method, then the uh, response function is basically uh, linear, so that this kind of bridge shape is cannot be expressed with this linear detection method. So once try to uh, once to confirm whether then the extreme event uh, is more frequently occurred during the recent period, we check the difference in the occurrence of the ex extreme precipitation uh, events between two periods. The P two is uh, from defined during 2016 to 2020, and P1 is the uh, number of extreme events occurred from 2001 to 2005. Once we calculate the difference those two, so there we can see the increase in the variability is evident over those hotspot regions, while uh, the, hot, the increase in the variability is relatively not robust uh, outside the hotspot regions. But the problem raised that the, the precipitation product we used for the validation is the satellite-based and, uh, and the reanalysis, which is basically the, the mixture between the observation and the model. So the question would be raised whether this kind of changes in the precipitation variability happens in real. So we checked the same 
statistics using the rain gauge data, which is the direct measure of the precipitation. But uh, unfortunately, we have the rain gauge data only the over o only over land areas, so we uh, we couldn't we couldn't check this kind of statistics using the rain gauge data over the ocean. So once we check this kind of uh, change in the vari variability of the precipitation over the land area, so over the U.S., we can see relatively higher increase of the var variation is check the eastern part of the U.S. And the hotspot regions we defined is somewhat overlapped, even though the hotspot region we defined is mostly over the ocean, but it is somewhat overlapped to the land area. So uh, the uh, hotspot regions is somewhat overlapped to the eastern U.S., and you can see the increase of the precipitation variability is relatively stronger over the eastern U.S. rather than the other areas. One more minute. Sure. So yeah. And this summary, and I think it's uh, I, I think it's better to skip. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Are there any questions, Jürgen? Uh, yeah. uh, do you uh, think also to include uh, higher uh, layer information mm -hmm. for large scale patterns? I mean. Okay. Would change would change anything? That, that's yeah, I so say uh, Rossby waves or jet streams or something like this. Oh, so you mean the cause of the changes? Yes, yes. Uh, in this, so far it's more on the surface. Uh, of course, the wind is also or storms. Mm -hmm. So the precipitation is not only the, even though the precipitation itself is the surface variable, but it is strongly affected by the high, uh, the, the mid or upper level atmosphere. And I think it would be closely related to the shift of the, or the intensity change of the storm tracks or something, but it is something we have to investigate further in the future. Christian? Um, you had a slide where you compared different time scales, how they contribute to, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So what I don't understand with 10 day high pass filter mm -hmm. isn't, Basically, you, you you eliminate all frequencies which are much lower. So how can this contribute to the trends? And that should be in the low pass component, if I understand this correctly. So the linear trend of so the this is the linear trend of the estimation of the AGMT, and the this filtering is done to the input variables. So once we put the input variables after applying the time filtering, and we can uh, obtain the output result. And the linear trend, so this linear trend means the trend in the output variables. So, yeah. Uh, one question I have is regarding the uh, occlusion sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, run it also with the input data from the climate model again uh, in order to see if the pattern is robust because you have 100 ensemble members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder how many of the ensemble members pick up the same pattern. Yeah, yeah. So we are actually doing it. Uh, and it's very important that it should have uh, similar features. So it's very important to check it and we are doing it. And yeah, we just recognize that it's quite necessary. So we are doing it. Yes. Any other questions? Maybe anything online? Nothing? All right. Thank you again, Yugon.